can you start actually just down the road from where we're uh, sitting in a particular incident which for you kind of captures this notion of us living in a in a kind of weird state between war and peace yeah it was the the oxford circus panic which happened on black friday at the end of november 2017 police called it 1638 to uh, reports of, a number of reports of, a lot of people calling 999, shots fired. At the moment, and there is a major police operation underway at the moment. If you're in a building, stay there. If you're on the street in the Oxford Street area, uh, please leave that area. For about an hour, the news media were reporting, social media was reporting that there was some kind of terrorist attack going on in Oxford Circus. So now there are scenes of armed police going shot to shop. This is the busiest shopping road in London. Move! Move! There was a stampede, there was panic. Everybody just started running towards me. I heard of people just charging down. Panic, chaos, absolute mental. There was uh, police everywhere. Uh, the pop star Ollie Murs tweeted to his 8 million followers from Selfridges. He tweeted, F everyone, get out of Selfridge now, gunshots. Right, there you go. What people thought was going on and what later turned out to be going on were, 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 were two completely different things. Worth reiterating this latest statement from the Metropolitan Police, from London's police service, saying we have not located any trace of suspects, evidence of shots fired or casualties. Now, in addition to that being uh, a sign that in some ways the kind of veneer of, of civilization is, is not quite as deep as we might like it to be, the other thing which interested me about the incident was what it tells us about the nature of truth. Tweeted out to seven million followers that there were shots fired, they weren't. Yeah. Stuff like that. But who's getting their news from Ollie Murs? <laughs> Everyone knows that a story isn't true until it's confirmed by the Rizzle Kicks. <laughs> We're back for a new series of Polarised, the podcast from the RSA. It's all about trying to understand the big divides in our society and culture and the forces driving us further apart. It's presented by Ian Leslie and by me, Matthew Taylor. So I've missed you, man, to be honest. Uh, I've missed you too, Matthew. It's been, it's been tough. In this episode, we're asking, have feelings taken over the world? Most of us tend to believe our own decisions are sensible and rational. Other people, though, they're prone to ignorance and being duped. They've let emotion and feelings triumph over reason and facts. The, the, the fact that people are motivated by what they feel, by their emotions, being a long-standing fact means that if you want to try to get people on your side of the argument, you have to speak to those emotions. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organisations from acronyms the people of this saying, country have had saying, enough of experts. Had, with, with with That's the story some people tell about this political moment. But does it check out? And if it does, can we fact-check our way out of our problems? Or should we embrace the politics of emotion? So coming up, we'll be talking to the political economist and writer Will Davis. But before we uh, get started, this is a, a segment, we, we call it full disclosure. We lay our cards on the table about the issue that we're going to talk about. But I think we'll do it slightly differently this time, because I, you know, I haven't seen you for a few weeks. But I, I know that over the summer, I've been kind of gassing on about a couple of things. You know, you go to dinner parties, you're on holiday, whatever, and there's a couple of things that I keep talking about. Uh, is, is there anything that you're, you, you've been had a, a kind of particular trope about over the summer? Or any opinions you've had that have particularly hardened? Yeah, I mean, I, well... I haven't been allowed to, to talk about politics at home because my wife is on a news fast um, and, and is actually feeling a lot better for it. But but that's, that's another topic. Well, an actual proper not... Yeah, I've heard like about people doing this. all the news, yeah. yeah. Um, wow. I have to turn the radio down if, if the news comes on. Um, but uh, so so here's what I haven't been able to say, although I have said it plenty on, on, on <laughs> social media, um, which is that... I, all this clamouring uh, and arguing for, for a second referendum from people who are on the Remain side, right? Incl I'm on that side, just just in case anybody didn't know. That's full disclosure, folks. Uh, full disclosure. Um, uh, is starting to. It's getting louder and louder, right? And and it just it seemed to be it seems to be getting like a more realistic prospect. But what really strikes me is that nobody thinks, nobody's really thought about whether and how they're going to win it. 
right? People seem to have somehow just conflated the idea of a second referendum with winning a second referendum. When they say sec- we need to have a second referendum, they mean we need to reverse Brexit. It seems to, be, to have become the same thing in, in their minds. And the, the debate, from at least from the Remain side, but really from both sides, hasn't moved on since uh, 2016. We've learned nothing about why people you know, voted leave. We haven't really engaged with them, thought about their their point of view. And we're just presenting the same arguments, which is you were lied to again and again and again, hoping that at some point they'll go, yes, you know what? Gosh, you're right. I was lied to. I was duped. What a fool I was. Now now I see the world the the way that you do. This is never going to work. Which I think is exactly the kind of issue we'll be talking to Will about in a few minutes. So that's been your kind of Riff that you know. Let's distinguish the idea of a second referendum from the idea of remain. So, so my two first one will be very brief about. I am in the tiny proportion of people that thinks Theresa May is going to pull it off. And this isn't, by the way, just because I'm impressed by her kind of abba dancing routine. <laughs> I was going to uh, say is that, is that uh, all it takes. I, I thought she was going to pull it off right from the very beginning, and I'm in an ever diminishing minority. But I, my prediction is this, and this series lasts long enough for us to know whether I, I proves to be right. I think the EU will give her a bit of a deal. I think they'll say it's a one-off special deal for her because I think they kind of re- realise because of what happened to David Cameron that you know it'd be really problematic if they don't. And they've got volatility in their own countries. So I think they they will manufacture a deal. There'll be lots of fudge and spin, but they will say, yeah, you've got a great deal. And she will come back and she will say to all her backbenchers and very openly say to them, right, here's the, here's the, you know, here's the choice. You can vote for this and we're out. And if you want to get further out in the future, as Michael Gove says, you can have a go at that. If you vote against me and you defeat me, there'll be a general election. If there's a general election, you'll have Jeremy Corbyn in power for five years. Well, and you might you'll have a, lose your seat. You yeah. might have a second referendum, but there's a second referendum. It might be Remain, in which case it's out of the window for two generations. You want to be responsible for that? You know, make my day. And I, I, think, she'll, I think she'll get it through. So we'll find out whether that's true. But my second thing is increasing and growing gloom, really, about, I was going to say about liberal democracy, but I think really about the capacity of societies like ours to kind of get over themselves, really, to run ourselves, to even exist. It seems to me I've, I've come to the kind of view of a profound existential crisis Whoa. in modern democracies. And uh, and when I read Will's book, which we're going to get on to in a second, it confirmed some of my worst fears. Wow. OK, that sounds like a good moment to introduce our guest. So we're sitting here uh, with Will Davis, a uh, political economist, a kind of all-round public intellectual, uh, someone I, I think you worked for me when you were very, very, very young, didn't you? For uh, sure. Possibly, yeah, and maybe we overlapped a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, he's the author of Nervous States, How Feeling Took Over the World, which the Evening Standard described as being like Black Mirror without the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fan. That's great. What a great, what a great I'm description. I'm not sure it was that great, but <laughs> I'm sure there were some jokes in it. <laughs> well, Black Mirror is pretty good. I think I'd watch Black Mirror without the jokes, <laughs> although I'm not sure it make me very happy. Hello, Will. Hello. Thanks, thanks for joining us. So let, let's talk. Well, actually, Will, can you, can you start where the book starts? Uh, which is actually just down the road from where we're uh, sitting. And a particular incident, which for you kind of captures this notion of us living in a in a kind of weird state between war and peace. Yeah, it was the the Oxford Circus panic, which happened on Black Friday at the end of November 2017. There was, for about an hour, the news media were reporting, social media was reporting that there was some kind of terrorist attack going on in Oxford Circus. There was a stampede. There was panic. There was uh, police everywhere. Uh, the pop star Oli Mers tweeted to his 8 million followers from Selfridges saying, uh, get out of Selfridges now. There's gunshots are, are sounding. No, yeah, I, let me, because let, let me, it's a podcast, but not the BBC, we can actually say <laughs> what he's tweeted. He tweeted, fuck everyone, get out of Selfridge now, gunshots. Right, there you go. Uh, and that was to 8 million people. The Daily Mail picked up a, a tweet which they they thought they'd found evidence that a, a lorry had mounted a pavement. This, uh, Tommy Robinson said this looks like another um, uh, ISIS attack in London on Twitter and so on. Now, in addition to that being uh, a sign that in some ways the kind of veneer of, of civilization is, is not quite as deep as we might like it to be in, in, in certain ways, and that certainly the, the, the sense that violence is a possibility in our society kind of lurks in our psyches in ways that perhaps we are not often conscious of, but it can be triggered quite easily. The, the other thing which interested me about the incident was what it tells us about the nature of truth, because in some ways the difference between a rumour and a fact is the amount of delay that, that, that takes place between something becoming established as a fact. And there was about uh, an hour or two hours or so where what people thought was going on and what later turned out to be going on were, 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 were two completely different things. So in some ways, it's a, uh, one of the things that interests me about that is that some of the threats to 
truth and expertise and authority in our society stem partly from the rise of what you might call real-time media. So I, I want to look at another event which I witnessed because I was in America recently, which is the hearings over Brett Kavanaugh. Now, the viscerality of it was mm. quite stunning. I mean, yeah. you know, the whole of America felt like it had stopped and it was watching yeah. this hearing. Everyone had a very strong view about it. That view was only to a small extent influenced by the credibility of the two respective mm. witnesses. It was much more informed by where your starting point and yeah. what you kept, what you brought to it. The Kavanaugh thing also yeah. is a, is is just the kind of thing you're talking Absolutely. about, isn't it? So yes, uh, and that I think you mentioned the viscerality of it. One of the main themes in my book is that we often th like to think of ourselves as rational mental creatures political animals that are governed by ideas by language by we engage in dialogue with one another but one of the principles really of liberal democracy dating back to the 17th century is that the body is kept somewhat separate that political uh, life is something that is uh, that operates via language and is something i suppose immaterial but as you were kind of alluding to that there's something about the way in which politics is now done that it seems to, in some ways, come from the gut to a great extent, that it is something where people's... The, what, what is deemed credible is something that is done, that is based uh, heavily on appearances. And that one of the things that interests me in the book is that we often reach for the language of, of war increasingly and of combat to try and understand the forms of division that are opening up. We talk about culture war, we talk about uh, sort of information war, troll wars and so on. But in some ways, it makes more sense to imagine some of these conflicts conflicts using the language of violence than it does in the language of, of, of reasoned discourse. Will, w w when you're talking about feelings, you're not just talking about emotions, are you? No, and I, I, this is where, in some ways, I think the body comes in. And uh, again, another another sort of tidy um, line that we like to draw in liberal democracies is that, 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 that sort of things like physical pain aren't actually part of, of politics. Um, but that actually, you know, one of the, just as an example, I, I, I talk a bit about some of the evidence in the United States that actually some of the key swings in the Midwest in the 2016 election correlated in kind of interesting ways to particular rates of ill health um, and and physical pain. Um, and there is plenty of evidence in, in psychological and, and physiological research showing that people who are experiencing high levels of physical pain tend to become more pessimistic. They can also shift to the right in terms of their authoritarian values in certain ways. Now, it could be that with aging populations that this is which is where a lot of the rising levels of pain in the west come from that this is something that links uh, to um, some of the changing attitudes in the political space now that again is something that in some ways we're uncomfortable thinking about the body as being a driver of political attitudes and behavior but maybe that's something we need to open our, our minds to a bit more so you, you it, it, the heart of your book is the suggestion that two distinctions that have served us since the Enlightenment, the mm. distinction between war and peace and the distinction between mind and body, have kind of broken mm. down. This is, a, this, is the, this is the kind of premise in a way. This is what I use to try and understand this, uh, this, this disorientation that has taken over our politics and particularly a disorientation around the role of facts and of expertise in public life that it seems that around half of the, the population uh, on the other side from uh, most of the, the you know, the, the people who are probably listening to this podcast <laughs> seem to be uh, no longer persuaded by facts and, and, and by experts. And this is what is often called post-truth. But to try and get a different take on that, one of the things that I, uh, uh, my, my, my starting point is that in the mid 17th century, at the time of Thomas Hobbes and René Descartes, and uh, as there were uh, religious wars tearing Europe apart, the separation of both civil society from the domain of, of, of violence, that is a kind of key uh, achievement of, of Hobbes's political philosophy, but also is the, the key achievement of the, the Westphalian system of states that was established in the mid 17th century, which is to say that within this particular political society, uh, disagreements will happen at the level of, of, of argument and of, and of language and exchange will happen via commerce and so on, but that it will be, the, the, but the acts of war will be confined to a different space. That will be when, when states 
intervene in other other societies. Meanwhile, there is the the, the famous dualism of, of Rene Descartes that the mind and the body are, are made of completely different things, uh, and that to think and to act rationally is to be governed purely by processes of the mind rather than the body. Now, these distinctions have actually been dissolving for quite some time. And this, if there's anything reassuring about my book, and and from your introduction, no, Matthew, not I'm much not sure. Sure. <laughs> it's to say that nothing very sudden happened in 2016, uh, and that actually, when you look back over the last sort of 120 years or so, these these disintegrating boundaries have been uh, th- th- this disintegration has been happening for some time. In a sense, a lot of what we call post-truth, which was this term that that came along in 2016 and was declared word of the year by the Oxford English Dictionary that year and so on, is in some ways referring to, well, first of all, a lot of what gets called post-truth is simply the attitude to truth that is taken during times of war. It is not unusual Mm. if someone were to say, you know, we are currently in a state of war and therefore uh, the government will seize control over various means of communication and that various uh, messages will be screened and sent out with a view to trying to mobilise people in a certain way. That would be considered to actually be a reasonable (laughs) state of affairs. But when when populists do it during times of peace, that is then considered to be a sort of extremely damaging thing. I'm really interested in this because I'm uh, listening again to the news this morning to Today, the British security services have said that it was the Russian security mm. services who were responsible for a set of of hacks. Now, I kind of assume that our security services are doing some stuff I'd rather not know about as well. Yeah. But in the end, I, I, my judgment is there's a bit of propaganda in this, but I'm happy with this bit of propaganda because... It's my propaganda, and I think in the end Britain's a better country than Russia in terms of its kind of core the core values. So I guess one of the points you want to make is we're, none of us are mm. innocent of this. Or, no. All of us are more receptive to messages that we want to have. And in a way, all, nearly all facts, particularly any kind of political fact, mm. is set in some kind of propagandistic context. But I think that there are other... Um, ways in which facts are committed to the public record that we still can, I think we still have to maintain some trust in as as offering us a way out of this kind of uh, hellish conflict, whether that be, you know, Hansard or the public accounts or uh, the BBC or um, whatever it might be. The because ONS. They, yeah, the ONS. Yeah. I don't see any any alternative right now to in some ways kind of rediscovering that the, the, but, the properties but, of those things. And, and, and just want to note on that, in, a, in the last series of Polarised, when we, we talked to a researcher about polarisation and, and the media, she found that the BBC was... Versus other countries, our political discourse is is in in quite good shape, um, mm. and a lot of that is down to the centrality of, of the BBC. One of the conundrums of the modern world is that there are people like Stephen Pinker, for example. You reviewed mm. his book recently. We had him speak at the RSA. Who will argue very convincingly, Hans Ronsing the same, that the world has never been better than it has yeah. before. That that our kind of anger and uh, loss of faith in liberal democracy is totally misplaced in terms mm. of what's really going on. Now, what I'm interested in is firstly, why it is that just fails, that Mm. kind of position, which is trying to persuade us we've never had it so good, fails. But the second thing that fascinates me is that some of the people who advocate that position have now themselves become a political force. Mm. Yeah. Uh, The intellectual dark web. You know, they have become a group that fill the O2 and other places by having debates saying, we stand for cool Mm. rationality. But they're no, they no longer stand for core rationality because they've got their own kind of passionate yeah. fan club. And that's a that's a f- fascinating kind of irony, isn't it? Really? It is. And I don't think there's an easy way out of it. I mean, I talk a bit about the March for Science in the book, which was this sort of mobilisation of scientists on the streets of American cities in, in the march after Trump took office, which ultimately it's something like that has to happen in some ways. Um, because I think that you know, I think that scientists are human beings and pretending that they're not doesn't really help anybody in the long run. I think that Pinker and, and these sorts of figures have become, I mean, they've become their own kind of angry brigade in yeah, a way, absolutely. is what you're saying, I think. And Dawkins are the same as well. Um, and they say, you know, that the facts don't care about your feelings and that, uh, that you know, it's sort of, it becomes an increasingly kind of reactionary kind of movement. So I, I wasn't quite quite clear mm. well what you think the right strategy is because i think mm. you, you 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 do want to say and you have said that we shouldn't give up on the idea that there are authority figures and i think you argue that that what is important is the public feel that you're disinterested if they think mm. you've got a stake in the game mm. then they're not they're, they're they are perhaps understandably skeptical about the yeah. facts you are so they trust the ons yeah 
but the second a politician repeats an ONS fact, it no longer is no longer trustworthy because yeah. the politician so the politician is repeating it. But then at the end of your book, so you would have thought, well, this is a plea mm. for kind of rationality and let's go back to the evidence and try and get it, try and get people back on track. But at the end of your book, you seem to argue that actually we just need better wars. You know, we need to have a war <laughs> on climate change. We need to have a war on human suffering. That in a game, we have to play the emotional. The progressives have to play the well, emotional game better. I, I think that there is. A, a sort of human need to find things to mobilise around. So I make a distinction in the book between a politics of mobilisation and a politics of representation. And that liberal democracy is basically founded as a politics of representation, which is that most people kind of stay at home and other people sort of act on their behalf in various ways, whether as judges, politicians, journalists, experts, and so on. But populism is a politics of mobilisation. And that means that literally moving people, both emotionally and physically, onto the street uh, and getting people involved in politics who previously weren't interested in politics. Politics, and that is what we've seen over the last decade. Now, that mobilisation doesn't seem is going to go away. I mean, that's part of the problem. I mean, you can't sort of wish it away. I mean, Stephen Pinker can't wish it away. It's not going to, not going to go away. Those technologies that allow people to be mobilised uh, are not going to go away. I mean, one of the dilemmas I sort of had writing that bit of the book is, you know, if if some sort of evil coalition of kind of Cambridge Analytica, uh, the Kremlin, and um, various sort of troll farms and so on were able to change attitudes towards climate change, so that people believe that this was something that needed to be taken very seriously, would that be something that worth doing? Now, I mean, this is a kind of a you know, that's a, that's a horrible dilemma that progressives who basically believe the facts on things like climate change and read the Guardian and follow the BBC face is that, you know, is there a sort of need to kind of seize some of these sorts of tools and to seize some of the, the, the techniques of populism? But isn't the danger here? And, you know, I, I have to, I have culpability here. I work for New Labour, mm. you know, I was around the kind of the spinning and all that kind mm. of very effective presentation of mm. political factoids. You know, Ian's works in the, with, you know, with the advertising industry. We're both implicated yeah. in this world. Isn't the danger that if you kind of fight by the same rules, you just enter, enter a world of utter relativism. And I suspect that in this world of emotion-driven relativism, the right, the mm. populists, the nationalists... Have the better tunes? No, I mean that. That I mean clearly the um, you know the, the the politics of sort of um, of of blaming and naming enemies is is something that mobilizes people better than anything, and that's how a lot of a lot of populism works. I this is a this is a serious risk, and obviously there's also the whole notion of what's called left populism as well. But I don't think that there can be a sort of uh, a politics that simply kind of resurrects an appeal to kind of expertise and facts of the sort that things like the Remain campaign were based on and so on, that is not going to come back to life anytime soon. So the question is how to somehow marry aspects of that to to some of the techniques of, of, of mobilisation. You know, we might not like some of the techniques, but they don't have to lend themselves to that type of populist uh, enemy blaming. So, and what's your view? So, do we fight for some notion of objective truth or do we become better at, do we become better at propaganda? Well, I mean, I, it's like, like the question of, let's put it another way. If there, there was a, a Democrat uh, American president and he was extremely popular, he's kind of Trump-like figure who was fiercely popular with, with uh, his or her own side. And he said, in order to fix climate change, we're going to have to call an end to term limits. In fact, we're not going to have an election this year. It's really important that we stay in office because we this is the planetary crisis, mm. right? So we, we need to just just do this, okay? And, and you know he had like fifty one percent of the people uh, on his side. Maybe they hold a referendum. Or something. It's it's that kind of question. Like, is it worth sacrificing some of your, the basic tenets of of democracy? Uh, uh, the, the kind of notion that there is a kind of shared world of of, of facts in order to achieve some end. I mean, I think. No, because like you never know really if you are going to achieve that end. Mm -hmm. What you do know is that is that these these norms, these these principles are pretty good ones, mm -hmm. um, and that we abandon them at, at our peril. So, well, you you, you might just describe monetary policy making. I mean, that's sort of you know that's how the European Central Bank would have looked from from the perspective of someone in Greece in in two, between sort of two thousand and eight and, and and the present. So, I mean, the fact is that that sort of anti democratic technocracy has already been at large in many uh, liberal democracies for some time. I think that just I mean, Matthew, you posed the the sort of question of which I mean it was probably sort of deliberately kind of black and white. 
between do we kind of this go is, for, this is for propaganda right. yeah. <laughs> and objectivity. But I think the one thing that I've tried to do in the book by taking a more historical perspective is to sort of to ask the question, well, where does objectivity come from and what kind of good does it do politically? Because I, one of the things I have, the problem I have with someone like Pinker is he sort of says, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And there's a sort of sense that like I've got all this data, you haven't. So if you think the world's getting worse, then you're just sort of empirically wrong, basically. Now, there is a different way of thinking about objectivity, which stems from pragmatist philosophy, really, uh, which is to say, well, it is a way of reaching agreement with other people, which is it's the ability to, uh, with, to, the ability to overcome differences by de- developing a shared account of the world. And that involves creating shared frameworks in the form of statistics and accounts and reporting techniques and so on. And that changes the, how the whole ideal of objectivity and truth looks, away from it being, I'm right and you're wrong, towards it being, here is the basis of a peaceful settlement. So that's my sort of, my, my pitch really, is to sort of say, look, can we think about the, the, the purpose of experts less in terms of uh, uh, truth, which is a sort of rather kind of, uh, I've always found a rather sort of heavy-handed kind of issue that, that populism has, has generated, and think about more in terms of the creation of social peace. I think the most skillful uh, sort of, for want of a better word, uh, centrist politicians understand that and do it instinctively. They're, they're looking for a way. They're, they're effectively saying to the people on the other side of the political debate, you actually agree with me on some stuff. Mm. So you, the, you may not even realise that you've been... Well, it yeah, could well, also be what the BBC thinks it's doing about Brexit, which is, of course, also something which generates a huge amount of sort of anger from people like Nick Cohen and others who have said that the BBC and Andrew Adonis, that the BBC has capitulated over, over Brexit and it doesn't report all of these kind of economic analyses properly of, of what's going to happen after Brexit. But the BBC potentially sees itself as in an extreme... I, I think they would be right to see themselves as in an extremely difficult position right now. And it may be that they're, they're playing the kind of pragmatist strategy that I outlined just now rather than the kind of pinker kind of I'm right, you're wrong strategy. Can I just go one step even further Mm. back in looking at uh, this issue? Because I I read your book immediately after I read Francis Fukuyama's new book on identity. This is making me increasingly feel that what we're talking about is a kind of existential crisis. In a sense, how do we live our lives? One of the points that Fukuyama makes is he says that we we are all wanting identity and two different types of identity. Mm. One is the notion of identity, which is the equal equal validity of every human being. But the other is the special identity of the group to which we belong. And the problem is, how do you contain these two mm. impulses? But he points out that the people who had status in the ancient world were originally were, were, were warriors, people who were willing to lay down their lives. Mm. What it brings me to is the notion that can we, does life mean anything to us mm. without kind of the sense of struggle, which is attendant with war and which is attendant on uh, this kind of feeling of, of passion, that in a sense that the, the burdens of being a human being are such that we, that we have to have this meaning in our lives, that human beings have to have some sense of struggle or else the, the fundamental kind of problems of the fact that we're going to die and then when we die, everyone will forget about well, it. It's just overwhelming. People, people lived in, you know, peacefully without war for, for a long time in sort of hunter-gatherer society. Um, and, and I think they, they, they lived just in very small societies and they lived right. perfectly healthy and they lived for a long time. Um, but they had uh, but you they didn't it, really have any freedom. But can right? you imagine in a mass society? That's the question. Mm. Can, yeah, can the, a mass that, society that like ours absolutely work? Absolutely the question, yeah. Without these kind of emotions which then turn into the kind of politics with, that we've with, got now. with democracy i mean that's the that's the thing i mean i saw a i saw a statistic I've, i'm i'm currently researching an article about scandals in britain and i saw um I was just looking yesterday at um, what happened after the MPs expenses scandal. And the first thing that showed up in the ONS data was that trust in politicians had fallen by half, but the interest in politics had doubled. So suddenly you've got this kind of sudden surge of interest wanting to be involved in politics, but no longer trusting the politicians. And that, in a sense, is the sort of, you know, the kind of seeds of this type of, of politics of people wanting to be part of some kind of some kind of army, in a sense. The tools of mobilisation have been kind of, which are clearly social media, and that's all in the last sort of dozen years or so. The tool, you know, the, these mobilise people around grievances. We are what behavioural economists call loss-averse creatures. We Our losses matter much more to us than our gains. Now, that is actually a complete inversion of how economics and commercial society assumes human beings are, which is that we are primarily motivated to get better and better off and richer and richer, mm. which is how Pinker thinks about things, is that, look, we live this much longer, we have got this much more money, we've got all of these extra things. But what if something about human beings, and whether you want to think about this neurologically or psychoanalytically or whatever, what if there's something about human beings that actually 
getting hurt and getting penalised and uh, suffering losses actually shapes us and defines us and uh, sets our priorities far more powerfully than the things that we're pursuing in an active sense. Because that ultimately is is why Donald Trump is is in the White House. Oh, right it's, now. it's also why you know. <laughs> People don't understand why people voted leave in 2016 in, in cases where, and this is only, only some of them did this, but they seem to vote against their own economic interests. Yeah, exactly. That incidentally was sort of how the book started, was the, the referendum happened in the summer of 2016 and people were just sort of astonished that people could act against some sort of Benthamite precept. And I began to think, well, let's think about human beings and, and, and liberalism in a different way. And maybe liberalism is founded on some fundamental errors about people. If it is that we are driven by loss aversion, and if it is also that the world is speeding up, the acceleration of the world means that the race of loss is even faster. That is to say, we are, lo- we, are, we are losing things more quickly than we have lost things in the past, and we will carry on losing them even more quickly as technology mm. continuously changes things. If that hurts, a lot of people are in a lot of pain, and people in pain mm. get angry. Yeah. Uh, well, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Uh, we might have to get you back here again, but again, because we, <laughs> we, we've only scraped the surface of your book. But um, thank you very much for your, thank you. it's been a pleasure. For, for your time. Now, before we go, we try to end each episode with a provocation, something that's shifted the way we look at the world, fascinated us in the last few days. Ian, uh, just to show how generous we are on this programme, I think we're going to be recommending another podcast. Yeah, I I came across uh, uh, this podcast, an episode of, of a podcast, which is called Dastardly Cleverness. Welcome to Dastardly Cleverness in the Service of Good, the podcast for people who make progress. Uh, the, the podcast series, by the way, is is about um, social scientists who who are using science for for some form of uh, social good, some sort of social enterprise. But this particular episode uh, was an interview with a political scientist called Murta Galesic, and Murta Galesic is really interested in how people form their political beliefs, and she she looks at that question through the lens of social network theory. Uh, the, the networks of friends and acquaintances through which everyone uh, uh, moves. One of the things that she found, by the way, she's she's really interested in this subject because she grew up in, in the Balkans and kind of lived through the experience of a relatively stable society collapsing <laughs> into, into warfare. And she saw people um, who had previously gone about around their daily lives getting on with each other very quickly taking sides <laughs> against mm. each other and for, forming different camps. Uh, and that left her absolutely kind of compelled to investigate this question of why that happens and, and, and how that happens. I'm originally from Croatia. Actually, when I was, when I was born, I was born in, in another country, which was Yugoslavia. And when I was 16 or so, the country started to fall apart. And it was a transforming period in my life when I seen how a seemingly stable system suddenly collapses in a kind of quite bad way uh, in a very short period of time. And one of her really interesting uh, findings uh, that she talks about in, in, in the pod is that that people, there's a, maybe a better way to ask people how they're going to vote than just asking them how, how to going to, they're going to vote, which is ask them how their friends are going to vote, how they think their friends are going to vote in the next election. Um, and she, she published a study of general elections in the US, the, the Trump-Clinton election, and in France, the Macron election where she she showed that asking a voter how her friends are likely to vote was a more reliable predictor of her vote than asking her directly right so so actually her prediction of how she was going to vote was was unreliable versus the question of like well how do you think your friends are going to vote just thought that was absolutely fascinating and what you said kind of puts me in mind to something that i felt for a while which is that we we tend a lot to our physical health you know running and what we eat and all that stuff and increasingly we tend to our mental health and meditation and we're obsessed by sleep now and all that but what's that kind of five a day for civic health is what I've been thinking about. And I certainly think that if you did have your kind of five a day for civic health, one would be you need to talk to somebody you disagree with on a pretty regular basis. You've got to have people in your friendship circle who you both like and disagree with. And I think yeah, actually... That's the key to it. Yeah, I think, you know, if you don't do that, you know, it won't happen accidentally. We know that. You will not accidentally have people in your network that you disagree with. You're probably going to have to go out and make it happen. 
But I think, given what we're learning and given what we've been talking to Will about today, I, I'm increasingly feeling that we, we have to kind of say, this is your civic duty. Your civic duty is to make sure that, unlike the networks you've just described, you don't just hang around with people who confirm your prejudices. Anyway, that's it for this episode of Polarised. If you enjoyed this episode, you might like our conversation with Claire Fox about anger in politics from the last series. You can find that on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and all the usual places. Polarised was presented by Matthew Taylor and by me, Ian Leslie. The producer was James Shield, and we were brought to you by the RSA.